What's going on here? Hello, I'm Jen Wicked, creator of Queen of Assholes, Have Tablet Will Scribble, Crap I Drew on My Lunch Break, and much, much more. You're watching Two Geeks Talking! And you're watching Two Geeks Talking. I don't see no geeks. Am I a geek? Does that make me a geek? Well, what would you like to be? <laughs> Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today by a very talented creator. I have been following their work from 2003, basically, when I started reading webcomics. Uh, they have created uh, a lot of wonderful work, but I'll let them describe it. We are joined today, of course, by the ever-talented Jen Wicked. How are you doing today, Jen? All right. How are you? Doing good. Doing good. You know, when you get started in in web comics, you know, back in the early two thousands, that's that was basically the heyday of web comics. That was really when everything was kind of gelling on all cylinders for a lot of talented creators. How did you get started in web comics? Well, um, like I said in a recent blog I posted, you know, my background in comics and my influences come primarily from newspaper strips. So I had been following a few web comics myself. And in the summer of 2003, I was working in a frame shop full time. When I was joking around with a coworker, we were listening to NPR and I don't even remember what it was. I made a couple of jokes that had to do with like the art that I was framing. Um, I think that's actually where the Buddha Claws strip at the very beginning comes from. I got a couple of ideas for comics and I went and pulled some eight and a half by 11 paper out of the computer printer and grabbed a thick ballpoint pen and hammered out what eventually became the first crap I drew on my lunch break strips. So, I mean, that's where the name comes from. It was literally just crap that I drew on my lunch break. You know, getting started in, in art, of course, is always a, a a fun and creative experience, but it can also be challenging as well too. What do you enjoy about being an artist? That is such a loaded question. <laughs> um, enjoy might be the wrong word. It's, it's kind of something that I'm driven to do. It's something I have to do. I've discussed it a little bit elsewhere, but I figured out last fall that I'm on the autism spectrum. And for me, at least, um, my art and my comics have evolved as a kind of uh, alternate vocabulary for me. So they became a way for me to articulate really complex emotions or ideas or, exper you know, relay experiences and, and just basically a communication tool that I could use when I found language and other ways of expressing myself to be too difficult so it, it, it's not a matter of um enjoy it's more of you know uh, art and drawing and this kind of communication to me is like you know it's like asking you like hey why do you enjoy breathing you know like <laughs> it's just something i it's intrinsic to who i am i can't i can't separate it out mm. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it makes sense. It's, uh, I mean, for me, I, I went back to school for visual arts and film. So my background is computers. So being very logical in that sense and then being thrown into the deep end of creativity is was a foreign concept. So to express myself in, in the art that I was dealing with um, through photography, in, in my case, was just was difficult because I didn't know the the need to create at that time. So as a, as a full-time artist yourself, I mean, you've been dealing with this uh, creativity for through for, for all of your life. Um, you know, has it helped you in your life to be creative? Oh, oh, definitely. You know, I mean, I, I don't know how I would have survived as long as I have without having it. I mean, I was given my first box of crayons at like two years old. There's a video on my YouTube channel um, called Jenny 
and and part of the montage of videos and clips in there you can actually see some of the drawings I did when I was like two or three years old and this has been with me my whole life um I didn't go to school past high school I've only taken like a couple of art classes in middle school and a couple of years of art classes in high school so that's that's all the formal training I have it's never been a a separate process, you know, the creativity and the artwork and that form of expression has just always been an intrinsic part of who I am. Throughout all of your career, though, you've been doing this since 2003, right? I first started building websites in 1998, mm -hmm. but the first few websites I built weren't were just kind of random, like fan pages and stuff. I started kind of making my own homepage and art gallery in 2001. And then in 2003 was when I started webcomic. Talk about your first convention as an artist, though. I mean, if you can go back that far, you know, what was your experiences as, as an artist showcasing your work for the first time? Conventions have always been kind of a funny thing for me. I'm not super fond of doing them. Um, the first one I did, I think, was anime fest it might have been the year of katrina hmm. i'm not sure I, I i'd have to look and see nope i take that back one of my first was in houston it was a small convention where i think i finally met in person my friend jackie lesnick they've never been big money makers for me i don't do a lot of paper books um and haven't done a lot of merchandise traditionally so you know they, they've been a mixed bag especially Back in the day when I was a little less assertive, I have had experiences where men came up to me and were, you know, asking to photograph my necklaces. And I realized after like two or three minutes that this man was taking close up pictures of my breasts, been inappropriately touched, you know, hit on. So, you know, for, for me, at least my, my experience with conventions has been very mixed. Hmm. That has been less of a problem in more recent years one, because I carry around an umbrella all the time now and take no shit. I do them because I enjoy them. Um, and when I don't think I will enjoy it, I don't do them. I've had much better luck doing things via social media and my websites and crowdfunding situations like that. Well, let's talk about social media because obviously it's the best way to promote your work, um, especially when you're trying to fight against 7 million other people. <laughs> it's, yeah. a, it's a difficult struggle. But what are your main social medias that you, you found success on? Contrary to practically everyone I know, I fucking love Facebook. Mm -hmm. I have had the most uh, best return on my investment with Facebook. Um, but Facebook is a strange beast. You have to learn how to use it. You have to put in some effort um, to kind of figure out the posts that get you better engagement, uh, ways of wording things, the kind of images to use. So, you know, it can be challenging for someone that doesn't really have the patience or the um, desire to put in that effort. But Facebook has by far been the best uh, investment for me. Facebook drives most of my web traffic and Facebook drives a huge part of my Etsy sales. How's the Etsy store been for you over the, over the years? I've been very happy with Etsy myself. Um, they do have, I know, some issues that, that other creators have had either with, you know, different fees, um, advertising and things but but my experience with Etsy has been good uh, they offer a lot of convenient features for me like you know one click shipping and automatically emailing buyers that um, has kind of a, almost amounted to giving me an, a virtual assistant um, which when you're just doing everything by yourself every little bit helps so Etsy I've been happy with I used to just list all my original art for sale on a web page and people would email me that system was clunky i've lost all my records from that time period so like certain old artwork i i don't even know who it was that bought it you know 10 or 15 or you know 20 years ago 
Um, and then briefly for a while, I had my own web store set up, you know, which you have to deal with integrating PayPal and mm -hmm. dealing with the SSL certificates, which aren't as big a deal as they used to be, but uh, it was just too much. I mean, for me, the amount of fees that Etsy charges is, is, is worth the added value I get from all the, the features they provide. And people trust Etsy and you can't underestimate that. You know, if, if a buyer doesn't know who you are, but they've purchased from other Etsy sellers and they come to Etsy and they see something of yours that they want, um, they're much more likely to go ahead and, and buy that sale or, or buy that item or risk that unknown um, compared to if you're just, you know, JoeBobsWidgets.com that they've never heard of before and maybe your web design isn't that great or whatever. Original artwork is always amazing to have from from a talented artist like yourself i'm sure what have been the responses to to when they've received your work for the first time like physically in in their hands i've been very fortunate um i'm not aware of any incident where someone was dissatisfied with artwork that i sold them um way back in the day when i used to sell paintings uh, I would typically frame them before I ship them. And there was a couple of instances where someone got the artwork and they weren't quite thrilled with the frame on it in person. And I, I, I remember one specifically where they returned the art to me. I reframed it and sent it back and then they were happy. But uh, other than that, I, I've uh, had pretty positive experiences. I make sure that I provide plenty of photos of the original work. Um, in instances where I have edited the work digitally in uh, kind of post-production, which I do with most pieces, I try to disclose any differences between the original piece and the finished version that appears as a comic or in my art gallery or wherever. Uh, I do not use or own correction fluid, so uh, I try to, I know, right? If it, it, I get fucking 20 hours into something, if it's messed up, if it's that bad, I fucking start over my art store. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I just try to provide lots of photos and full disclosure. You know, this is what you're getting, so you know what you're getting before you buy it. And uh, I haven't really had any issues. I have a lot of repeat customers, and um, everybody seems pretty happy. Uh, my work is a little pricier than a lot of artists kind of at my level. I put a lot of time and energy into my work. It's my process is just excruciatingly time consuming. Um, and to be honest, I feel like a lot of artists underprice their work. So, you know, somebody else is, you know, charging less than minimum wage per hour for the piece of artwork they're selling, you know, it, it doesn't put any responsibility on me to underprice my work as well. There's a lot of times where artists don't understand that particular side of the business either too or maybe they choose it because they don't think they're worth the price right that and um, you know i'm sure for some people you know it's like well you know i need to eat so i'm just gonna sell this for whatever i can get for it but uh over the long term underpricing your work is a losing game um especially when you you know price things double and you have to constantly offer coupons or sales or whatever, uh, you're devaluing your work in the long run. Uh, for me, I would rather initially value it higher. Uh, and then sometimes if I have a, a Patreon member who has been with me for a long time and they throw me a dollar, three dollars, five dollars a month, mm -hmm. uh, I'll discount a piece of work for them because they are loyal long-term readers and they regularly contribute uh, versus flashing the price of something in half for, you know, somebody that's going to buy like one thing and then I'm never going to hear from them again. I'm always curious about this when it comes to being a creative person. Uh, and I've talked to a lot of people over the years from your perspective, how do you manage stress? Uh, I don't. I have kind of two modes. I'm either fine or in like full panic mode. So there's not a lot of management between 
I'm kind of okay, 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 until I reach that point where I get overstimulated by something and then sort of panic. But I, I, I generally tend to not have a lot of stress. Um, over the past few years, especially, I have deliberately kind of cultivated a practice of non-attachment. I try not to be too emotionally invested in the outcome of things when I can. And I tend to not get worked up about small stuff. Uh, people that have been following my blog over the last few years will know that I worked as a home health aide for about a year in a couple of different old folks homes. And most of my time was spent in the dementia ward. Um, which people with very advanced dementia, you know, some of them almost are completely nonverbal. Uh, that is a stressful situation for most people. And I just have kind of reached this point where in a lot of instances, I'm relatively unflappable. Um, for me, the difficulty came in when I was given far more work than I could physically manage. And it was causing me to just kind of physically break down. But uh, I just, I, I'm just not a person that really sweats the small stuff, you know? I mean, oh no, you know, somebody hit my car with the shopping cart at the grocery store. You know, somebody cut me off in traffic or things like that. It just, it, it doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of things and, and those sort of things just don't bother me. So uh, as long as I have adequate alone time and quiet time and downtime, I guess that's, how I sort of manage what stress I do have is just that, you know, I need a lot of solitude to recuperate um, and I need quiet to be able to focus on my work. But as long as I get that, I'm good. What's the most misunderstood aspect of autism that people don't understand? <sighs> this is all still relatively new to me because I've kind of just recently figured this out about myself, but I think maybe of what I have encountered so far, at least for me, it's felt like I get blamed a lot for things I can't necessarily control um, in the sense that, for example, I tend to take things literally when, when people say things to me, unless it's extremely obvious that uh, they're not being literal. Um, and so, you know, I have frequently been accused of being like difficult on purpose or, you know, being antagonistic on purpose or that kind of thing. Like people neurotypical people assume that one that you're always aware of what you're doing which you can be but it's a process to get to that point um i have a really severely bad habit of putting my foot in my mouth you know so i'll be trying to say something that i really have good intentions and it will just come out as like a horrible insult when it leaves my mouth. And it's like, this, that is the complete opposite of what I meant. Mm -hmm. um, and you try to like backpedal and explain yourself and they're just like, ah, why are you doing this? Ah! You know, like I, whoa, you know, but that's not what I meant. You know, I, I called you an idiot because I like you. I know it doesn't make sense to you, but it made sense up here when it came out my mouth. Um, <laughs> so I, I think that's the biggest part of it is like, I think sometimes it's hard for neurotypical people to conceptualize the different process that goes on inside your head. I have, I, I read the other day, they called it webbed thinking, but I have a very kind of interlocked visual thinking style. I think in images and I make all these strange associations in my head that may not be obvious to other people um and then i can act based on that and it's made me very observant and it's made me create some really interesting artwork where i kind of collage all these strange images to say whatever it is i'm trying to say but um it's not 
a deliberate process. You know, I, I don't go out of my way to be difficult. I don't go out of my way to be antagonistic. And I wish that, um, I wish that people would have maybe a little more patience uh, and a little more compassion for somebody that does have persistent communication issues. So for me, that's probably been the most uh, misunderstood aspect is like, I know that I look normal and I, okay, for varying definitions of look normal, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I, I, I don't look like there's anything wrong with me per se. Mm -hmm. um, but that doesn't mean that I don't have a problem. Just like when someone parks in the handicap parking space at the grocery store and gets out and walks into the store, you know, just because they're not on crutches or in a wheelchair doesn't mean that they're fine and they're parking in a handicap space for no reason. Um, these things are invisible. You can be upfront about them. You can disclose them. Um, but still, I feel like people maybe don't have as much patience as they should for, for someone that, that does have these kind of developmental differences. Interesting. I, I was always curious about about that. I've interviewed a lot of people where um, they have their own internal uh, issues, and sometimes, you know, I I don't know if a question I ask triggers them the wrong way or, or hits them the wrong way, and I just I just want to be aware of how I could be a better interviewer that way. So I thank. You oh, for that. well, thank you. Um, I, you know, like I am so full disclosure in all of my work and stuff that, that, it, that, that kind of thing doesn't really bother me, especially, um, when I'm talking about anything that I know about. So, you know, I was a custom picture framer for 20 years. You would never know that I had any sort of issues the way I could schmooze people at the sales counter, <laughs> but it was because it was very scripted and very predictable. And so I have all these, you know, I have like this mental, like it's, it's like a video game or something, you know, here's a select responses in this scenario. And so I have these scripts in my head. Uh, I have them for conventions. I have them for different, you know, employment scenarios. And so every time I'm put in a social situation I'm unfamiliar with, I have to relearn the expectations and relearn what I'm uh, supposed to be doing and, you know, how other people expect me to react. Uh, so anytime that I'm talking about my work or anything I know about, you know, that that's very easy for me because I already know all those answers. It's, it's, it's the real time communication with people that's chaotic and unpredictable that, that I really struggle with. If only everyone could follow video game dialogue scripts, it makes life. I know, so right? Easier. Why can't we all just have a little boop, boop, boop. Oh, you know, <laughs> how are you today? I'm good. Thank you. <laughs> just like a whole Mass Effect dialogue set, you know, just give me the exactly. paragon good and evil and away we go. <laughs> exactly. What's the wisest thing someone's ever told you that's helped you in life? There were a lot of, um, there were a lot of people I, I helped, that I helped take care of at the old folks home um, that would occasionally dispense different bits of, of wisdom to me, but um that's a tough question. I really don't know. It's okay. It, it's an open-ended question. Yeah, you know, I I think kind of consolidating maybe what I learned, kind of the cumulative wisdom that I learned during that experience, during my time working there, uh, was again, just like not to sweat this fall stuff, you know, and, you know, to really kind of uh, keep a good perspective on what matters in the grand scheme of things, you know, you'll see people with regrets because of things they didn't say or things they didn't do or chances they didn't take. And so 
because of that and also because of the time that I feel I wasted, you know, kind of not knowing myself for the first 40 years of my life. Um, I, I would rather like make myself look like an idiot and, and say, or say something stupid or, you know, whatever, something along those lines, uh, then, you know, oh, you know, what, what are these people going to think of me? I'm going to make myself look like a fool for 30 seconds. I promise you two days from now, nobody's going to remember it or care, you know, but, but you'll remember the chances that you didn't take and, and you'll remember the things that you didn't do because you were just afraid or too worried about what someone else would think. Um, so that was kind of a, the wisdom that I gathered from my whole time doing that is when you look at people who are at the end of their life, um, just really making the most of the time you have while you have it, especially while you are still able-bodied and healthy and able to really enjoy it. Uh, that was the, the lesson that probably stuck with me the most and the wisdom that stuck with me the most. Regret can be a powerful emotion. Yeah, I, I no regrets. <laughs> like that tattoo. Yeah. <laughs> Just make sure it's spelled right. Um, Correct. <laughs> from a personal perspective, at what point are we good enough? And can we always self-improve until the end of our lives? Oh, for sure. Uh, no, the only constant in life is change, right? Mm -hmm. We're all in a constant state of evolution. Um, either because of my autism or because I'm just a fucking weirdo generally, I've been a little more maybe literal about it than most people. So, you know, I, I have like a copy of Maslow's Pyramid, you know, uh, Maslow's Pyramid from a few years ago, I'm like, oh, have I finally achieved self-actualization? I finally kind of feel like I know myself and I feel like a whole person, but, um, you know, there's, there's always somewhere to go. There is no final destination until, you know, you're dead. And honestly, I, I, I feel bad for, for people that kind of get locked in that mindset of, oh, when I have this award, or oh, when I sell this many books, or oh, when I have this much money in my bank account, or I have this or that thing, that then I'll be complete, then I win at the game of life, you know, it doesn't work that way, you know, you, you just have time, that's all you have, that's all any of us have, and you have to, you have to do the most that you can with it. Um, and if you really want to make the most of your life, then you you do kind of go on this long process of, if not self-improvement, at least self-discovery. You know, if you go on this long, intense, personal self-evaluation and decide that you just really fucking love sitting on the couch watching Seinfeld and eating Cheetos, power to you if that is your ultimate pleasure in life and that's what you want. Um, but I think that no matter what you choose to do, you should at least be deliberate about it. And I don't think that there's an end point where you can just say, okay, I self-improved, I'm done, I'm, I'm good, let's go. Uh, it, it's a constant process. And for me, um, especially, because it's so integrated in my artwork and everything else. And the more content I am internally, I, I tend to branch out. And so I, I get involved in politics, and social justice and, and other things externally. Um, if, I, if I feel like there's nothing I need to work on in myself in the moment, then it turns outward. And I try to put that energy elsewhere and improving things outside of me. So I'm just, I guess, kind of maybe a perpetual fixer, but yeah, you know, I, I do think that life is a, a constant process of, of self-improvement and maybe the, the greatest thinkers, you know, and the, the, the people that achieve the most are the people that just never 
give up. They just kind of relentlessly pursue that until they're just, that's it. You're all done. It's over. If your life was a movie, what would the title of that movie be? Well, that escalated quickly. The Jen Wicked story. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. That's, that's good. It, I'm honest. Yeah. No, that that's great. It's great to to be not only self aware, but to to also be constantly improving in your life. To to be able to just say, you know what, fuck it. This is it. I'm I'm good with life in general, and let's keep the ball rolling. Well, you know, my comic, Queen of Assholes, which um, my friend Christina is like super worried about trying to sell a book called Queen of Assholes. So when it actually like gets published, it'll probably just be called Queen with like Queen of Assholes on like the inside cover. Mm -hmm. Um, That title comes from someone I was in a relationship with who, you know, because of this problem I have with my mouth, uh, started calling me an asshole because of a few things that I said. And I was working in another frame shop at the time. It was around Halloween and they had like plastic crowns for sale. And one day I just saw one and I put it on and started wearing it around all day. (laughs) Uh, and I took a picture of myself and sent it to him on Facebook messenger. And I said, look at me, I'm the queen of assholes because I was trying to reclaim that label that he had given me in a way. And that's where the title of that book came from. You know, like most of my stuff just comes to me. Uh, But really, as my concept for that comic evolved, that is going to be kind of a graphic novel, chronological biography. So it, it really would be like the story or movie of my life. And you know, what it's about is figuring out who I am and kind of reclaiming that. Uh, The asshole part refers to my inability to accurately communicate Mm -hmm. what I'm feeling or thinking and this kind of trouble that I have repeatedly gotten myself into over the full 40 something years of my life because, you know, when somebody asks me what I think about something, I fucking tell them. And sometimes you shouldn't do that. <laughs> sometimes you just should say, it's lovely. Thank you. Have a nice day. I'm not good at that. Uh, so, you know, that that's really kind of what it's about. So you, you'd have to say, like, okay, Queen of Assholes is really the, the title. But, um, but, but well, well, that escalated quickly is also accurate. I honestly like both titles to be perfectly honest. Do if if you have a follow up to Queen of Assholes, that escalated quickly would be the second title of it, I think would be awesome. I, I, I'm sure I will use that for something at some point. Um <laughs> I have I have a few kind of back burner projects that I don't even talk about because they're so far kind of in the back of my mind and so I have actually like this list of titles and Sometimes I get an idea that I pull one of those old titles out from that list, and, and I'm sure that one's in there somewhere. <laughs> That's great stuff. Maybe somebody can make like a documentary about me at some point in the future, and they could use the title for that. Um, I call dibs on that. I, I did go okay. to film school for it, so might as well. All right. <laughs> That'd be cool. Call me. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> we can Twitter over it. Um <laughs> Is there anything that I haven't brought up that you'd like to share with those that are listening and watching to this particular interview? Because I know we've talked about a lot in general. I want to make sure that we we get to cover as much as we can. I just want to say to like the people that subscribe to my Patreon, the people that, that do buy my art and books, I just really appreciate the patience everyone has had with me, especially over the past few months as, uh, I went through this process where I, I had a double mastectomy, I had a hysterectomy. Um, I've been recovering from that, and due to the ongoing harassment and some other personal issues I've had, I was kind of forced to finally confront some really dark and troubling stuff from my past and work through that. And so I haven't been outwardly the most productive artist or cartoonist over the past 
few months. And uh, now that I'm kind of in a better place, obviously I'm like doing interviews and, and getting myself back out there. I'm hoping to change that. But I really do appreciate the patience that uh, my supporters have had over this year um, and the ones that have stuck with me through that. That's awesome. Good stuff. All right. I'll ask my last four questions here. I appreciate you for taking the time to do this. Truly, Jen, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. And I appreciate the opportunity and thank you for tolerating me taking 15 or 20 minutes to figure out how to get audio <laughs> over Zoom <laughs> understand what's going on. So this is my first video interview. I said I didn't want to do interviews on video, but you know, I'm stepping outside my comfort zone well i i truly appreciate it at least you know this is another verbal well technical feather in my cap even though i don't wear hats because you know hat head um but i do appreciate it truly it's um i i've been a huge fan of your work and in for many many years you're like i said in the previously before the interview started your your stippling truly is what inspired me to to break free from my lack of artistic knowledge and all uh, the little it, dots all the dots it was very very soothing to be perfectly honest it was amazing it can be yeah did um, you some white noise going on yeah basically anyone that listens to my shows just put it as background noise there you go <laughs> i'll get to the last four questions here but uh, thank you again hang on a second here everyone has one or two people that inspired them on their path where they are today who was that for you i've talked about this a little bit recently because of some other reasons, but uh, I, I would say probably one of the biggest influences in my life, if I have to narrow it down to one person, uh, would be Drew Hayes, who was the creator of the indie comic Poison Elves. It is a kind of gritty, very adult, uh, dark fantasy comic, and the only comic I've ever collected as a floppy book and a friend of mine, a guy I was kind of, I was dating at the time, he worked in a comic shop and he introduced me to Poison Elves. And, and that comic is really when you see me begin to do the heavily inked, hatched, stippled artwork uh, that I'm, you know, for the people that know me that I'm fairly well known for. Uh, so he really was kind of the genesis of that. Uh, it is a very unique book. Um, and probably more than anything else, what attracts me to something is its uniqueness. Uh, so he had no formal art education, kind of, as far as I know, kind of similar to me. Um, his anatomy is kind of strange. Uh, his lettering is pretty messy in places. Uh, there's not really a consistent format. Sometimes he'll just do an illustration and then put a giant block of prose next to it. And so this really unique book that was nothing like anything I had seen before kind of fell in my lap. And I just, you know, it made such an impression on me. Uh, and then on top of that, back around the time that this happened this is 1998 or so uh 1999 you know i bought my first internet enabled computer i got online for the first time i was on america online <laughs> a lot of people don't even know what that is probably anymore oh yeah um and i would hang out in chat rooms with other artists and stuff and i really can't remember how i got connected with him in the first place but I ended up enjoying a brief friendship with him. We chatted on the phone several times. You know, he would look at my work. He would talk to me about his work. And at that time in my life, that was just so important to me. Uh, the fact that somebody whose artwork I admired took the time to talk to me about my work and, and kind of have that friendship and that personal relationship with me. And so, you know, if I have to choose one person, he would definitely be the one that has influenced me the most. Uh, and just to mention too, back at that time, 
uh, I found some chat rooms where like Magic the Gathering artists would hang out. Nice. And I, I want to name drop a few people, you know, like I used to chat with Tony Dieter Lizzie before he was whoop, big deal. Um, I have artwork that Tony Dieter Lizzie sent to me and gifted to me, original art. Uh, I used to play Ultima Online with Douglas Schuler. Um, I used to regularly chat with Quentin Hoover, who sadly, I think, killed himself, I learned later. And, and he would talk to me about some of his issues around those kind of feelings. And so right at this important pivot in my life before I first moved to Minneapolis for like a year, and then right when I came back, I was very, very fortunate to befriend many of the artists that I admired. Uh, and I don't have relationships with them now. I haven't spoken to them in years, but that's something that's always stuck with me. And I try to pay that for, you know, when people come to me and, you know, they tell me about how my work has influenced them when they you know want my opinion about something when they want to share you know how i emotionally resonated with them in some way i i always remember those artists that took the time that they didn't have to take uh to be supportive to me and to be encouraging to me and i and i always try to keep that in the back of my mind when I'm talking to people at conventions or when I'm talking to people online and, and just pay that forward. From a professional standpoint, you've created many, many books. You've created many comics. You've, uh, you're very talented in that regard, of course. Do you consider yourself personally successful? Yeah, absolutely. Um, what is success? What is, you know, it, like I said previously, there's no, there's no magic metric where, ooh, I've, I'm successful, you know, give me the little ribbon to pin on my shirt and call it a day. Let me put the trophy on my mantle. It doesn't work that way. It's a state of mind. Uh, what is success for me? Success for me is, did I do better at this illustration than the previous one? oh, you know, I pulled off something I was technically trying to do, therefore I was successful. Uh, did I grow my audience a little bit this month over the previous month? I did, great, I'm successful. Uh, so success is a process. It's not a prize or an end goal. Um, and it's really just a state of mind. If you're always chasing moving goalposts, if you're always running after the next thing, uh, this may be shocking, but when you get that thing, you're still not going to feel successful because that's really not what it's about. Um, so yeah, definitely I feel successful. Will I attain more success going forward? I certainly hope so. I certainly expect to because I don't intend to stop or quit uh, or, you know, cease this process of striving to improve myself in all kinds of ways. So uh, for sure, success is just the state of mind. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? Honestly, I, I love it, you know, which I, I know may seem counterintuitive, but uh, more than anything, I love learning. And so in some ways, failure is more exciting than success because if I'm trying to do something and I succeed at it, I know what I did right. But if I try to do something and I fail at it, I get to come at it from a hundred different angles and say, okay, what did I do wrong here? Um, you know, did I, color something too dark? Did I mess up this process? Did I say the wrong thing? Did I do the wrong thing? A failure is something you can dissect and learn so much from it. Whereas the success is, boop, okay, great, you know, on to the next thing. Uh, so failure has never been a thing that discouraged me. Uh, it's just 
part of a learning process and I am all about the journey. And so, you know, every failure, quote unquote, I, I don't even really like to use that word because I don't feel like it was a failure. It feels more like a botched experiment where I didn't get the results I was expecting. So I, I don't find it personally discouraging. And again, coming back to not sweating the small stuff, honestly, like nobody cares, you know, uh, you know, I, I do a comic where a joke doesn't quite land or whatever. Well, okay. Do better next time. Uh, I've had videos where I thought something was fucking hilarious, you know, and I recorded it and then kind of uploaded it and it just, boop, you know, like, okay, it was sort of a flop. Well, you know, all right, we'll try something else. What did I do wrong? Did I edit it wrong? Did the joke just not work? Was the timing off? There's so much you can learn from a screw up that you can't learn from a success. So, you know, that that attitude has been very helpful for me in recovering from various things that could be perceived as setbacks and, you know, flops or whatever you want to call them. So uh, failure is just an opportunity to learn and do better the next time. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative themselves, either as an artist or videographer or whatever they'd like to do creatively. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? I think most importantly, you just have to be willing to not give up um, and just try to maintain some of the Good attitudes, I think, like I've tried to share here about what success means to you personally, um, how to process quote unquote failures. One thing that I have encountered a lot in the last few years that has been an issue for me, not so much personally, but more in my relationships, try to maintain a level of self-awareness try to be very conscious of feelings of envy and jealousy and uh, things of an egotistical nature because they will not hurt the person you are envious or jealous of. They will not harm the people who threaten your ego. They only harm yourself. Um, and so you want to try to maintain some humility, maintain some self-awareness, and uh, be open with both yourself and the people that are inspired by your work, the people that are coming up behind you. Uh, I have been treated very, very well by the people far above my pay grade. Um, and again, like I've already mentioned, just to repeat myself, that's something I try to pay for it. So try to remain humble, always try to pay it forward. And uh, I really don't think you can go wrong that way. Good stuff. Thank you so much, Jen. I appreciate you answering those questions. Thank you. Thank you for your patience dealing with my technical issues. That's okay. Where can we find you before we let you go? Where can we find you on social media and uh, where can, how can we support you? What's the easiest way to do that? I'm Jen Wicked pretty much everywhere where I actually have a presence. So Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, TikTok, though I'm not super active on TikTok yet. And uh, Tumblr, YouTube, everywhere, Jen Wicked. You can go to jenwicked.com and at the bottom there's links to all of my social media, the different online stores I have where you can buy t-shirts and prints and things like that. There is a link to my Etsy shop. Of course, the, my bread and butter, the thing that helps me the most is when you buy original artwork from me because that is directly compensating me for the time I spent creating that piece of artwork. Other than that, I really appreciate the people that subscribe to my Patreon. Uh, that's been very helpful for me. Actually, before Patreon existed and before I kind of quit working for a while, I used to do something similar on my website where I would have like a monthly donation goal and I would keep a little uh, graph, you know, to show how much I had gotten that month. So Patreon has been a godsend for me. Uh, it's been something that 
enabled me finally to unshackle myself from having to have a day job. And uh, it's where I probably post the most. If you want to see my work in progress stuff, if you want to see the things I'm doing that aren't yet completed or kind of just vague ideas, if you want to I read, I, I post uh, kind of more stream of consciousness blog posts. They're not as composed and structured as the ones I post for the public, kind of more of a day-to-day -day journal and all that kind of stuff. That's behind the paywall on my Patreon. And it's only like a dollar a month to sign up. And then, like I said previously as well, if you find a piece of original artwork you like um, a year from now and you've been throwing five bucks at my Patreon, you know, when I sell you that artwork, I will look at, you know, what you've contributed to me and kind of figure that in. So uh, it's, it's a good system for me. It's worked very well for me. Well, Jen, I do hate to say this, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. Again, thank you so much for coming to the show. I really appreciate it. Thank you again for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. As I say every week, uh, everyone has a story to tell and it's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks again for listening and watching. Tune in next week for another great interview on Two Geeks Talking, where I don't know who's going to show up, but I'm sure they'll be amazing and talented and creative because that's what Two Geeks Talking is all about good conversation for a good time hey all kurt sasso here from two geeks talking if you like this video and these quick clips here make sure you take a look at our youtube channel youtube.com forward slash tgt media make sure you hit the like button and subscribe as well hit the bell to make sure you get notifications of course from videos like this here uh thank you everyone for listening and watching over the years and keep listening and watching for new and exciting interviews with talented and creative people in the entertainment industry. I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. Thank you so much.